Hey guys, welcome back. This is JK Ultra. And today I wanted to share with you my UFO experience. So before I get into it, um, I just wanted to say that this experience um, of me and almost my whole family seeing a, a UFO, and I will get into all of it. It wasn't just flying in the sky. Um, there's more to it. But when I went under hypnosis, when I did the QHHT hypnosis by Dolores Cannon, um, one of my questions was, why did that happen? I did ask a couple questions about it, and I will get into that later. But to start this off, um, I wanted to share my, I asked, what is the purpose of this experience? And it's really important. So um, I know a lot of you guys watching and who watch my work have had some interesting experiences, either with aliens or with ghosts or with entities. Um, and, you know, it's, it could be embarrassing or, you know, scary to share those things, you know, being afraid of being judged. Um, I People constantly confess to me that they've had these experiences. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Like, hell yeah, you had that experience. You don't need to be ashamed of it or be afraid of being called crazy or any of these things, you know. So when I, when I asked under hypnosis what was the purpose of this experience, it was really beautiful because my answer that I got was that I'm a validator for other people. So in a way, I had to experience that UFO alien experience at such a young age because I needed to know early on that there was no doubt because part of my purpose was to validate other people's experiences and you know, I wish I actually listened to the recording of the hypnosis before this, but so I, I don't know the exact wording, but basically I also said that, you know, there's a lot of people on this planet who are aliens and people like me are not only validators for them, but they're validators for other people's experiences. So this is the reason why I'm into all of this weird stuff, you know, crazy stuff. And I've been this way ever since I was younger because, yeah, of course I don't believe what I'm being told um, in science class about physics. You know, like, you want to tell me there's these laws of physics when I've seen with my own eyes and my whole family saw that was not the case. So... Also, people want to say that, you know, there's no proof of aliens. I don't need outside proof. <laughs> I've seen it. I seen it. So I that's why part of that was also a lot of people have experiences that they don't remember. And it was important that I remembered that experience because it was going to be a part of my life to validate those experiences for other people. And it never crossed my mind that I could possibly, you know, not have experienced that because it was absolutely real. So I guess we'll get right into it. So I grew up in Jersey. This was in Jersey City. And that is about less than five miles from Manhattan, you know. So basically all of the, the pictures of the New York City skyline they're taken from across the Hudson River, which is where Jersey City and Hoboken are, which is, you know, I grew up in Jersey City. My mom is from Hoboken. So basically, you know, we kind of grew up in this area and it was like, you know, now it's very gentrified and like artsy and expensive. But, you know, not when I was living there. It was not at all. So we were kind of like the ugly stepchild of the boroughs because, you know, you have like the five boroughs of New York, but then there's like Jersey City, which is like, 
you know, it like gets really shat on by everything because also too, like everyone from Jersey is like, oh, you're a bunch of New Yorkers. And then like everyone from New York is like, Jersey's not New York. So you're kind of like this like middle child of the family uh, being in Jersey City because it is a really cool place to grow up because it is the most diverse city in America. And it's also one of the most densely populated because it's so freaking tiny and there's so many people. Um, So even just going to high school was like, we had a multicultural day. There was 140 nations, people from 140 nations, their lineage, whatever, in our school. So I don't know. I always was like very well versed in a lot of different cultures because I would go to my friends' houses and, you know, try their food and you know, see their holidays and all that stuff. So, you know, it was definitely a very cool place to grow up. Also, this is basically where Ellis Island is. You know, they say that's the thing with being from this part of Jersey is that a lot of the things that are New York are actually in Jersey City and you just don't get the credit for it. So like the Statue of Liberty, it's actually in Jersey City. Um, But New York owns it, so they say it's New York, but it's actually Jersey City. And, you know, Ellis Island is also technically in Jersey City, which is part of the reason why it's such a culturally diverse area. Not that people come to Ellis Island anymore, but, you know, that's where my family came over from. That's where a lot of, like, you know, the initial, like, European immigrants came from. And then over the years, obviously, people didn't come to Ellis Island anymore. But um, also, you know, like these like teams, like the Giants and the Jets and stuff, that's all in Jersey. Okay. So just saying, um, so that was, you know, kind of just the backstory of where this happened. This didn't happen in, you know, the backwoods. This happened in one of the most densely populated areas of the country, like not in the middle of nowhere. Another thing I want to add which this has changed this statistic, but at the time it was the statistic all the way up until maybe the last 10 or 15 years. So oddly enough, Jersey and specifically that area of Jersey had the highest UFO sightings of anywhere in the country. Um, So one of the things that I've always thought about it was like maybe because it's so close to New York, there was something there Um, that couldn't be in New York, but it was only, you know, less than, it really depends where you are, but it's like five miles from Manhattan. So, and that's like across water. So I always suspected that there was something there. And this was about, about four miles. So like across the water would be New York, but then to the side, there was another city called, um, North Bergen, West New York, that whole area. And there's a giant park there. Um, And, you know, there's, it's, everything's so tight and like literally there's just people living on top of each other. Everything is so tight there. Parking, the streets, it's, everything's like overcrowded. And like I live in LA now and LA is big and wide and open and not as crowded. That's how crowded it was in Jersey City. And also it makes LA look clean Um, but so in this area in North Bergen, there's this giant park. I should have looked up the name of it. It's basically like a, you know, um, government park, you know, I don't know why can't I think of the name of it? It's not a national park, but it's like, you know, it's owned by the state and this park has a lake in it and I remember when I looked this statistic up that it was like something like 700 sightings or something near that little lake in this park. And then there's like tons of apartment buildings all around the park, like stacks and stacks of apartment buildings, you know, like 15 floor apartment buildings. So it's just like super densely populated. And this park which was maybe about three miles from where I had my experience, uh, there was a famous UFO sighting there. And I'm going to put it in the the description below. I don't know why. I was just winging this whole video with no preparation. Um, 
I guess I didn't realize that I was going to mention the statistics of the UFO sightings in the area. So there was a famous uh, abduction there that happened in that park in like the 70s or 80s. And basically it was a guy and I guess, I don't know, he was driving through the park and he like sees a light in the sky and then some being comes out of a ship take some dirt I hope I'm remembering this right I will correct it in the the description below if I'm completely wrong so he th- this being comes and takes some dirt and then gets back in the ship and then this guy realizes that like a bunch of time was missing And then all of these people in these apartment buildings have claimed to see things there too. So this area that I grew up in had some of the highest UFO sightings up until recently because um, I think in the last 15 years, there's been like a ridiculous amount of UFO sightings everywhere, like more than there ever was before. So also, I was very aware of aliens before this happened. So this happened in... I believe, you know, when I did the calculations, I believe it was in 1993. And I believe this had to be the last week of June of 1993, which would make me um, almost five years old. And so I was at my dad's house, you know, my parents are divorced and I was at my dad's house. So it was me at almost five years old my younger brother, who was four years old, my two older sisters, who are five and eight years older than me, so one was 10, one was 13, my two stepsisters, one was 14 at the time, and one was probably around seven or eight years old. So just to clarify, me, a five-year-old, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 14-year-old. Six of us. The weird thing is that everyone kind of remembers someone else being there, but no one can remember who that person is. Everyone always remembers like another kid being there, but then we're like, was it this cousin? Was it this cousin? Who was it? But nobody could like figure out who this person was. But we all have a feeling that there was another person there who then was like not there in the story. I don't know what that's about. So, um, in my dad's backyard, there, um, was a swing set and, okay, back up a little in the backyard. And this is the weird thing that everyone remembers so vividly. Like everyone in my family, when they tell the story, they always mention this one really specific detail, which is so interesting. So my dad had just bought a new couch and the old couch was in the backyard until garbage day. So we're all in the backyard. So there's an actual couch in the backyard. And it was one of those like couches from the eighties where they kind of have like a wicker bottom. And then like on top of it was like a big flower cushion. So it was like black with like burgundy and white flowers on it. I mean, any of you guys who like had that eighties furniture in your houses, you know what I'm talking about. Um, You know, it was like wicker and a cushion. So we had this like, you know, full size three person couch um, sitting in the backyard until garbage day when the when the couch could be disposed of. So sitting on the couch was my two sisters and my two stepsisters. They were all together squished on this couch together. Me and my younger brother were over playing on a swing set and... Around that time, my stepmom opens the door, and at this point, it's about like 11 p.m., and it's kind of like one of the first days of summer. I was going to be spending uh, the summer at my dad's house because I lived with my mom, so so it was like school had just ended like a week before, and it was before 4th of July, I remember, Because I remember when 4th of July came, I was scared as hell looking up at those fireworks. I remember just looking up like, oh my God, no, please no. 
So June 1993, my stepmom sticks her head out the door and tells us, come inside. You know, it's getting late. It's 11 p.m. You know, you guys are going to be up all night. Uh, and everyone's like, no, can we just like stay out a little longer? My stepsisters are like, come on, ma, like, just let us, we'll be in in a little bit. Come and get us in a little, we're we're almost done. And so my stepmom, for some reason, you know, she says, okay, but then she locks the door, which is also another interesting detail. So she locks the door, um, And me and my brother keep playing on this swing set. And then I hear my sisters, all of them, uh, like freaking out a bit. Like they're like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And And then me and my brother look, but we had like just missed it. And so the four of them, like I'm sitting on a couch right now. So like the four of them are like sitting on the couch and then a white dove flew over them is what they said. So like right over the center of the couch was a white dove and they all freak out and it passes. And this is at like 11 PM at night. There's not doves flying around at that time. Needless to say, white doves, needless to say in Jersey city, like the closest you're going to get to that is an, an albino pigeon, you know, which is not flying around at that time, mind you. So me and my brother come running over and we're like, what happened? What happened? And they're like, oh, a white dove just flew over us and you guys missed it. You're never going to see that again in your life. And so like they start taunting us because, you know, this was just what big sisters do. They just, you know, uh, verbally and psychologically torment you any chance that they get. So... Um, they're like, you missed it. You're never going to see that in your whole life. And so we're like, no, not all. We're going to see it. So me and my brother take two seats and we pull them next to the couch and sit down. And we're like, no, we're going to wait for it to come back. So we sit down and like immediately after we hear this like sound and like, The sound is like, you know, when you like swing a bat, it's like, it's almost like a whistle. It's kind of like the, the wind breaking, like, like that little high pitched, like whistle sound of like wind of like air breaking. And like, um, so we hear it, but it's like loud, like really loud, like And I remember looking at the house because it looked like it was like, I just felt like it was like coming off of like the house, like around us. And I look at the house and then we look up more and it's like, and this is one second split into like three moments. It was so fast like that, but at the same time it was like felt slow. And so we hear this like whoosh, but it's like continuous, like not just when you swing a bat, it happens once. It's like again and again and again and loud, like super loud. And then so we look up and then we see a dot in the sky. And at that same second, it's the sound, a dot. And then instantly there is an actual UFO like an actual ship that is it didn't we didn't see it come down it was down already the second that we saw the dot it was there instantly it didn't like move (laughs) it just was and so we're all sitting here facing this way facing this way and in, then there's like a little gate between our um, backyard and the person next door. And in their, in their backyard, there was like a really big shed. So there's like this shed and then 
on top of the shed, not landed, but like hovering on it. Like it was like hovering on this shed was a UFO. And now the thing that was most shocking to me at the moment, maybe no, not at the moment, at the moment, the whole thing is like, what the hell is going on? But immediately after, like in the days after and weeks and months and years up until now, um, the thing that was really shocking to me is that like it didn't look as high tech as I would have expected. Like it didn't really look like the ships that I had seen on TV. The ones I had seen on TV were like way more sleek, you know, like, I don't know. Uh, you know what? Let me pause this and I'm going to draw it. Okay. So, I mean, this is a terrible drawing that I just did right now, but let's see. Okay. So, see, it just looked kind of a little clunky. So, this, like, middle part here was, like, spinning. And it was, like, kind of, like, a little squared off. Like, not, like, super, like sexy and sleek like you know how like Tesla's kind of look like UFOs like it didn't look like that like it kind of was like shaped like I don't know like a Camry from like <laughs> I don't know like the 90s no it was not shaped like a Camry from the 90s but you know what I'm saying like it was kind of just more like a little more squared off and clunky so like this top part here and this bottom part here were like stationary. And then this middle part was spinning. And then these are lights. So it looked like a lot of like individual little lights. And so this thing is like hovering um, in front of us. <laughs> like, and... I remember looking into the light and then seeing like, and that's why I kind of drew them like this. You probably can't tell, but like the light and now we have halogen lights, but in like 1993, there was not halogen lights in this way. But you know how like when you look into a halogen light, like it looks white, but then kind of yellow from an angle and kind of pink from an angle and kind of blue from an angle. Like, you know what I mean? Like it kind of was like, it's a white light, but it has like an iridescence to it, but you can only kind of see the iridescence, like looking at it from a certain way. So like when I was younger, I was like, Oh my God, like, I'm like, it was like a white light, but it was also yellow and pink and blue at the same time. And then I remember when, like, holo the first time I saw a halogen light bulb, I was like, alien technology, oh, that shit was what I saw on the bottom of the ship. So, okay, so we're all sitting there, and, like, this is one second. I know it's taking me, like, freaking forever to describe it to you, but it was literally one second split into three moments, and then weird I, I, looking at it and the one thing I remember is like I was looking at the ship and then I like look and there was a dog my my dad had a dog at the time named Cookie and she was like a, a white chow chow and I remember Cookie like went in front of us to like protect us and her tail was between her legs and she was barking at it and I remember seeing like Cookie like barking at it, but she was really scared. And then I remember like seeing her like shadow cast it from the light. Like her shadow was really long from the light. And so like I looked at the light and then I looked at Cookie. And then the next thing, we're all standing in a line. And like not in front of each other, like the same way we were sitting, like alongside each other we were now standing maybe like a foot in front of the couch in a line and then all at once we were like 
ah! and then everyone just starts fucking booking it back to the house, which it was not very far. It was like maybe 10 feet to the house, 15 feet to the house. You know, like I said, this is like a condensed city. We did not have a large yard. The yard itself was probably not bigger than my studio, much bigger than my studio apartment. It was a pretty tight garage. Um, so we're like, so it kind of was like, just to recap, they see a dove. We sit down. We hear the whooshing. Look up. There's a dot. The dot is a ship. It's hovering. I look at the, sh- the lights. I see the dog. And then we're all standing in a line. And at the same time, it's almost like we kind of like unfroze, like at the same time. And we all just like, ah, like, I don't know if it was like a delayed reaction. And like, I don't know, like, did we all jump up from sitting down? But it's like, it, I felt like we were in a line, which was weird. And then I was, you know, so the couch was here and then me and my brother sat next to it. So I was one of the closest to the house. And I also was always like abnormally tall and long for my age. So I just... I booked it. I was the first one back to that door. And then we're trying to get into the house, but my stepmom happened to lock the door. So we were locked out. So literally, like, I don't know if you guys ever saw that movie, The Relic, where there's like, they're trying to get out of the museum. And then like the people are like, or I mean, you could just see Black Friday deals at Walmart where people get like trampled to death. I'm at like the front of the thing trying to break through and everyone's like crushing me to try to get in. Um, so then my stepmom opens the door and we all go running inside and we're just hysterical. Like now the thing is, is that, um, my dad really loved aliens. He really loved like shows like the X-Files and stuff like that. So we were like, Oh my God, it really happened. But of course he didn't believe us. Um, he didn't believe that that's what, what happened at all. And so obviously it's the freaking scariest thing. Like, ever. I'm not scared about it anymore because I have a lot of different like understanding about the situation. Um, but I was scared about it for years. And so then they're like, Oh, you guys have to go to bed. Yeah. Good fucking luck. (laughs) Yeah. Like I'm going to go to sleep after that. So I remember me and my brother went to bed, the older siblings, uh, they said they had to go back outside and check if it was still there. So they went back into the backyard and me and my brother were just like crying in bed, like, oh God, they're going to come back. (laughs) And so my sisters said that when they went outside, the neighbor whose shed they were hovering on top of was in their backyard and was like, did you guys see that? And apparently this guy, he was kind of creepy, was sitting in his backyard the whole time. And like, we didn't see him in there. So I don't know where he was sitting, but he said he was sitting in his backyard quietly the whole time while we had been playing back there. And he was like, did you see what just happened? So then my sisters came back in and they're like, yeah, we saw it. It was just a plane. And I remember being like, it wasn't a plane. It wasn't a plane. And so I was like, literally like scared at night to sleep for years like sometimes I would just be like so afraid to sleep because I was like so worried they were coming back and like I said the reason that I kind of know the time frame that this happened was because 4th of July was about a week later or less than a week later um and I remember looking up at the fireworks and just being like oh no oh no Like, I just remember seeing those fireworks in the sky, like, oh, fuck, oh, God. And they just, I don't know what I thought. Like, I just, I don't know. So, and yeah, so that was like 1993. Uh, When I was maybe about like 21 years old, I got really like interested in trying to kind of look into this, if there was anything And I did find something. I can't find it online now, but I do know I have it saved on a hard drive somewhere. Um, I found a article. So the local newspaper was called the Jersey Journal. And they did post a, or they did publish a 
article from that summer. Uh, it was not the exact same date, but it was from the summer of 1993. There was a guy walking home from Journal Square, which was less than a mile from where we were. And he said that he had been walking home, saw a UFO in the sky, and then all of a sudden was walking on a different street. And then he realized that three hours had passed. And the street that they dropped him on was literally like five blocks from where we were at the time when this happened. So I will have to see if I can like dig that up somewhere. It was like, obviously I looked up, looked it up like, you know, f almost like 15 years ago or whatever. So it was easier to find then. Um, so there's a couple of other things that I want to talk about. So other things that were like interesting experiences. So about maybe three years or so after that happened. Oh, wait, actually, one more thing that happened in that backyard. And this is like so weird. It's like a very strange memory that like it doesn't feel like a dream. It felt like it really happened. Um, but then I always wondered like maybe it was a dream because that was just like really fucking weird. Um, so me and my brother were out there alone during the day and this bee, and now I thought that this is what queen bees looked like because this is what I had seen, but and we were smaller, obviously. So the size could be a bit exaggerated because we were smaller, but we were out there and we heard this like buzzing or whatever. And then... This bee that's like literally like a foot long, like like a foot long comes like flying into the yard and me and my brother just run and there was like a little kiddie pool, which, you know, those things are not deep at all. And like I said, I was a very long, big child. I'm still long and big. So like. I don't fit. I can't fit in. The, you think I fit under the water in the bath today? No, it's hard to take a bath. I can't get under the water. I'm too long. And so it was like the same type of deal. We went and we dove and we just went under the water and like put ourselves under the water to hide from this giant bee. Now, you know, after that, years later, I remember someone talking about like a queen bee. I'm like, oh, yo, those queen bees are big. And people were like, I mean, they're they're bigger, but they're not like that big. I'm like, dude, those those queen bees are big. I saw one once, and what I saw was not a queen bee. So I was like, oh wow, it must have been like a dream or something. And years later, when I was like 12 years old, I had a similar experience where it came into my living room. <laughs> and I was like, and I know it sounds so fucking weird, but like this giant ass bee. Now that one, it was kind of in a sleep state. So that one I woke up and I was like, damn, did I just dream about that bee that I saw when I was younger? What the hell was that about? About a year ago, I'm watching Cosmic Disclosure on Gaia and Randy Kramer, I know Randy Kramer is a hot topic. People get really freaking butthurt about that. I posted um, a clip from him and a bunch of people on TikTok got pissed. Like, this guy, there's no proof that he's a part of the government. There's no proof this guy's a scam artist. Like, okay, well, someone who was in a secret government program, would you really be able to find proof? <laughs> like, okay. And it's also different than people who started in regular military programs and then eventually gained clearance whereas someone like Randy Kramer who I didn't just watch one video on YouTube debunking him I've actually watched like at least 12 to 15 hours of his interviews and I have his book um so I I'm not saying that everything that this person says is correct or true um or that he himself might not be deceived by things but I do think that a lot of what he's saying is valid because it does line up with a lot of other things that I've heard from other sources. So anyway, Randy Kramer said this really weird thing like off the cuff in one of the interviews that sometimes interdimensional beings 
will present themselves as a foot long bumblebee. So when I saw that, I was like, because I really, I've maybe told one person about that because it's just like kind of like a weird thing that I was like, was that a dream? Was that a dream? Like I'm pretty sure it was not a dream, but especially when I went under the water, like I'm pretty sure that was not a dream. The second time when I was like a preteen and it happened, I was like, weird. Did I dream about it? There's no way that thing was in my house that just left. Um, so that was really weird that he said that. Another experience. So this one was when I was probably maybe seven or eight years old. Um, also, this one is kind of like something that feels like in between a dream and like in between reality. So um, my mom's blanket, and you guys know, I mean, everything's willy-nilly nowadays, but you know if you were alive in the 80s and 90s, you know, things were different then, and your mom's comforter, was not coming off her bed. You were not going to just take your mom's comforter and start dragging it around the house. You know, I know everything's freaking, you know, happy-go-lucky nowadays, but uh, my mom's comforter was not coming off the bed and then getting dragged downstairs and being on the couch. That just was not going to happen. So I have this dream that it felt extremely real, but that was the thing that was out of place. Um, And it does kind of remind me of the way that the couch was in the backyard, but there was an explanation for the couch being in the backyard. There wasn't really an explanation for um, my mom's comforter being downstairs. So um, on Friday nights, my grandma used to babysit me because my mom would go to her boyfriend's house for the weekend. So um, I was, my grandma wanted me to go downstairs and get my mom's comforter from the couch. So I took my dog Max and I was like seven years old. And like I said, this is kind of like a dream, but it felt like not a dream. And so now mind you, that first one that I told you, everyone that was there remembers what happened that day with that UFO coming down. That was absolutely not a dream that every single person, like even my one sister who like really doesn't like to talk about this stuff. She'll tell you that freaking UFO came down. It was there. Like everyone remembers it. And we all have the same details. Like even when I talk to my other sister, she always brings up that the couch was in the backyard and she describes the couch the same way that we all describe that couch. So, and, you know, she was 13 at the time. So it's coming from a different angle, not a four to five year old. Although I have a very good memory. Um, I'm able to remember a lot from my childhood. Uh, It's kind of the more recent stuff that I kind of lose. But for the most part, I have a really good memory. I mean, I retain a lot of information and memories and details and stuff. And so um, basically, uh, sorry, got distracted. Uh, So my grandma sends me downstairs. This is the dream that I had a couple years later, maybe more, probably, yeah when I was like seven or so, I had this dream. I had to go downstairs to get the, and I I lived in a scary ass fucking house growing up. Like, not like, oh, I'm a kid. Things are scary. Like, no, a genuinely scary house. That's part of the reason why I'm not afraid of things is because like my house was like Alcatraz. <laughs> like, I'm, I wish I was joking. Uh, if I like show pictures of my house, it literally was like horror house. Uh, it was just kind of decrepit and falling apart. And um, also it was super old. My house was built in the 1800s and my parents were renovating it and then they got divorced. So then like it just started to like decay. Um, and yeah. Uh, so basically 
there was a lot of very creepy energy in the house. There was always like walking and stuff. And I'd be like, mm, the house is settling, <laughs> you know, because, and I think that's part of the reason why I really don't have any sensitivity to like ghosts and stuff, because that is shut down. If I had any sensitivity to ghosts, I would have never slept my whole entire life. I would have never had a, a, a night's rest. Um, but when I was older and I would have friends over, like friends would start crying in my house. Like, you know, you lock them in the bathroom, like as a joke, as a teenager, like literally they would act like there was things happening to them in there. It was freaking haunted as shit. And also like there's like a creepy picture of my house in the 1800s of like all the people who built it. And it like, I don't know, it looks like a creepy Civil War picture, but then everyone's face has been like lost because it was an old picture. So everyone's face is gone. So it's like mostly just like faceless people. It's really creepy. Um, and they, we found that like picture inside the wall of the house <laughs> when we were finally getting the horrible bathroom redone, the picture was in the wall. I do have a lot of scary stories from my family, um, because we just like, we're creepy people. Um, so there was just a lot of creepy stuff always around. Like we found a weird skeleton key in the wall too, like weird shit. Anyway, um, yeah, like a bunch of weird baby dolls, like scary ass dolls, like looking like Annabelle and shit. Uh, but the house got knocked down. There's a whole weird thing with that. Maybe I shouldn't tell that part of the story. Maybe another day. There's like a weird voodoo thing that happened. Um, yeah, my mom kind of got tricked into doing some voodoo that she didn't really want to do. And then... There was like a jar with cow's blood and my mom kind of like got like sucked into doing this, but then she got scared and didn't want to. So they told her she had to smash the jar to finish the curse. My mom's like, I don't want to finish the curse. So my mom kept the voodoo jar of the cow's blood in the closet of the room that later became my bedroom. So in my bedroom, there was, which I never would sleep in that room. It was evil as hell. And there was a jar with the, the voodoo cow's blood, which actually it was. My grandma took her to like a real Haitian voodoo priestess in Amityville, New York to do this ritual. And my mom's like, oh man, what do I do with this jar? I'm not going to crack it. I, I'm not going to finish this, this curse. So instead, we kept the jar for 18 years in the freaking house. <laughs> so I'm telling you, this was a scary ass house. Um, <laughs> so to count also, just to end that random sidebar, um, to counteract the voodoo jar, my mom bought a, I don't know, five, six foot velvet painting of Jesus so next to the voodoo closet, that was so scary, that jar. It had like such dark energy that like the whole room had dark energy. Then there's a giant painting of Jesus on black velvet, like gigantic painting, obnoxious next to the thing. And I'm not going to lie, don't get, don't freaking you know, get too pissed over this one. But honestly, the painting of Jesus was even scarier. I swear to God, it was like those paintings where like the eyes would follow you. It was so scary. Me and my friend would like whisper and we'd be like afraid to talk in front of the Jesus because its eyes would watch you. It was so scary. So anyway, yeah, scary house. So I was going downstairs to get my mom's comforter in the dream again and just to rewind. So I took my dog Max with me because it was dark down there. So me and Max go downstairs, we get retrieve my mom's blanket and then I start to go back up the stairs. So like there's the staircase, my mom's room is at the top of the staircase and at the bottom of the staircase is one of the creepy bathroom. It's not a voodoo bathroom, it's, but it's a creepy bathroom. Um, I mean, both bathrooms are creepy. Who am I kidding? But that one was creepier. And so I'm walking past the bathroom 
and I hear Jennifer. And I'm like, what? It's like Jennifer. And I'm like, um, who, who's there? <laughs> and these, this thing, I, I knew there was multiple of them, but only one of them was talking to me. And they were like, come play with us. And I'm like, no, that's okay. I have to go upstairs. My grandma needs the blanket. And my dog, Max, is there. Um, and these things were telling me to come into the bathroom. And... Obviously, I didn't want to fucking go into the bathroom. Uh, so I decide to run past the bathroom to the stairs so that I can bolt back up. And as I run past the bathroom, I literally like a vacuum gets sucked in. And then this is the part that's really weird is that, you know, usually in dreams, even, you know, up until this morning, if something bad happens in a dream, I wake myself up right away. And in this dream, I couldn't wake up and it was dark. And there was three beings in there. And when I was younger, I didn't know how to describe them. Now I would probably say that there was some type of alien shit going on. But when I was younger, I kept telling people that they were glow in the dark monkeys that I was like, they were glow in the dark monkeys. There was three of them in that room and they pulled me inside. And so these like, when I'm in there, it's just like dark, but I could see like kind of like little like flashes of like these blue monkeys. They were like evil looking, but like I could barely tell what they were. And then... They were like on the sides of me and then it sounded like they were eating me, but like metal, like it sounded like their teeth was like made of metal and I was getting like chewed or something by metal and I couldn't wake up. I just was like in the darkness, continuing to hear this sound. And then I woke up like howling screaming when I finally was able to wake up it was like like I got up from like you know like I just freaking escaped hell um which the reason I bring up that dream is because you know as I have learned more about these alien experiences and I've read other people's experiences I've noticed that there's like a lot of times especially I highly suggest Keepers of the Garden by Dolores Cannon, where this is a great example of like sometimes there's these things that we remember being very scary. But then when you go under hypnosis, you find out that these were not scary and it's actually just our human perception that finds them scary. Also, that movie Fire in the Sky came out when I was younger. You know, that's like based on a true story about aliens I remember going to the theater with my family to watch it. You know, my family, we did like aliens. I'm telling you, we liked creepy shit. We're just weird, creepy people. And so the second that movie starts and there's like a UFO, I blacked out. Next thing I know, I woke up, we were in a car. So like seeing that UFO in that movie, like I was done. And I like, don't really fall asleep in movies. Even when I was younger, they always like said that like as a kid, I would go to the movies and stay awake. You know, a lot of kids would fall asleep in the movies. That movie, like I saw that, that, that UFO and I was like, and then woke up like in the car, like, where are we going? Um, so now though, of stuff that I've read and heard about these alien experiences is that a lot of times we kind of have these like weird things like that and then you later on in life find out that they are you know alien experiences that you've had things that kind of like feel like a dream but they're not a dream and you know they're like a real experience so 
when I went under hypnosis, I wanted to always know what happened that day, the real UFO, not like the dreams or stuff like that. And it wasn't until after that that I kind of started to think about those dreams differently. But, and when I started to think about those dreams differently was when I read Keepers of the Garden because a lot of the experiences that Phil, the main subject of that book, has very much mirrored some of the experiences that I had. And as I had been reading them, uh, cause I've read the physical and I've listened to the audiobook, and it's like, whoa, like some of that stuff, it gives you like a weird feeling like, oh shit, is that what happened to me? And that's in a lot of Dolores's books because Dolores did a lot of work with like UFOs and aliens and all that stuff. But, um, when I went under hypnosis, I wanted to know what happened that day with the UFO. Like, what? I did get the answer that the reason that it happened and the reason that I remember it, because most of the time people will have no recollection of these experiences, the reason that I remember it is because I was meant to be a validator for other people and their experiences and um, that I would always be there to let people know that they're not crazy and also, you know, I'm not crazy. <laughs> All right. Don't even try it. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to, you know, so other people, when they share their experiences, I've been able to be like, no, I know you're telling the truth because I know you're not saying this for attention. There's people who are afraid to tell anyone. They're obviously not doing it for attention. They barely even want to tell me. And so I asked what really happened that day. Like, because I've kind of had that like idea when I read Keepers of the Garden. Phil has like a similar experience with his family where like they're driving in a car and then they see something over the car and then they kind of like tell something happened and then everyone kind of like went back to normal after and was kind of a little shook up. But then when he went under hypnosis, him and his sister went on the ship. Well, or maybe the whole family went on the ship, but him and his sister like had like samples taken from them and there was all this stuff happening and like even at one point of the book like his consciousness gets taken out of his body and put in a container while they work on the body and a lot of times too when these things happen they're actually doing work on the body so I mean there's so many possibilities and I've read so much about it I mean I've been into aliens my whole life even after that happened I was afraid but I was very intrigued so I still, I mean, you know, when Ancient Aliens came out, I binge watched every episode, you know, before I ever even moved to L.A. or anything. You know, when that show first came out, I was like, it's aliens for sure. And so I asked under hypnosis or, well, the hip, the, the hypnotherapist asked, he, he asked, like, what really happened that day? with the ship and the answer that I got was that it's not time for me to know yet and he said well can you give us like a word or any information about what could have happened um what is it relating to what was the purpose of it um and the word that I was hearing in my head it was like I felt blocked like I felt like I couldn't really get information and the word that I got was exchange. And it said like exchange, like three times, exchange, exchange, exchange. And I don't know what that meant. And so the other thing that was coming to my head that I couldn't really articulate at the time because, you know, you're under hypnosis and you are aware, but you're also trying to like not be f like your, your conscious mind is trying to come through, but then your subconscious mind is like at the center stage. And 
there was like a story in my head that I couldn't articulate, but there, it's in one of Dolores's books. I think it's in the convoluted universe book. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's convoluted universe. Maybe it's book two. So convoluted universe book two, I, there's a story of these, this girl, she gets put under hypnosis and then she says that she's a twin. And when she was younger, um, around like seven years old or so, she and her sister went missing for a few hours. And it was like a really traumatic experience for the whole family. Her twin sister was fine by the experience, like wasn't really affected by it, but her, she was very traumatized by it. And not because she remembered what happened when she was gone. It was more so the family's reaction she was traumatized by how afraid the parents were when they came back. And she doesn't have any recollection of what happened. So she wanted to go under hypnosis to find out like what happened to her that day. Because, you know, she had worried about it for like 30 years. She was afraid of what could have happened that day. She doesn't know, had no memory of it. So surprisingly not what she was expecting she kind of thought like maybe someone took them or maybe someone did something and it turns out that her and her sister chose to come to earth like all souls do and you know they were kind of at that age where they were about to start you know you kind of have those like first seven years of your life where you're still kind of like half on the other side you're like not fully a hundred percent in your like humanness and they were coming to that point and basically they picked a family with too much trauma, too much chaos. They just didn't feel, they feel like they took on too much and they felt like there's no way that they're going to be able to live this whole entire lifetime with this family because they're so toxic and they're going to, gain more negative karma by staying but they've already agreed to these lives and they can't go at the same time you know they're stuck they felt stuck so because you know when you're a kid you're still very much interacting with your other side like you know the spirit side um, and your soul's side so these twins decided that they didn't want to be here anymore they bit off more they can chew and they wanted to leave earth. They didn't want to continue this life. And, you know, which is sad from such a young age. But these alien beings, alien souls like star seeds, had a contract with them that said, basically, if you guys bail on your mission, we will step in and take the place um, so when the girls went missing for those hours, and that was the other thing too, is that the family was always kind of like, they were weird when they came back. They were different when they came back and the aliens that took them, which they were good. All of the aliens are good. You read Dolores's books, all the stuff she talks about are good aliens. She does say that there are some negative forces and some negative aliens but she says that like 99.9 percent of like abductions and all of that are actually for the good although we may perceive them as scary they may be scary to us as humans but on our soul level on the bigger picture they are positive and they are for learning and they are for accelerating our soul's journey and these alien souls basically took over and they said like, okay, you guys don't want to continue your mission on earth. We're going to step into the bodies. You can leave. This is a walk-in situation. You guys get to cross over. You get to go back to the other side and we're going to continue to live out the rest of the lives for you. And now in these walk-in situations, most people like 90% of people with like walk-ins have no idea that they are a walk-in themselves. And, that's it. These girls live their lives. So it's kind of like a long, elaborate story. So when the hypnotist asks me, like, what happened uh, that day um, 
when my whole family saw the UFO and I kept getting the word exchange. And then I was like having that story in my head, but it was like, I couldn't articulate the whole story. You see how long it took me to even tell, you know, the story right there. And, but it was in my head, like, and it was like exchange, exchange. And then I was like, that story was there. So, but the answer that I got was that it was not time for me to know exactly what happened. Um, the guy asked if I went on the ship, uh, the UFO, and they said yes. The answer was yes. They said that me and one of the sisters went onto the ship. Um, I told my one sister, and she was like, hell the fuck, no, I didn't, even though I kind of have a feeling of which sister it was who did. Um, and that was it. They wouldn't give me any other information about it. And they just kept saying like, it's not time to know yet. And later on, I did do a session with someone who was a channeler. Um, the person kind of like ended up being like, I wouldn't say the person was completely full of shit, but there was a lot of dark stuff around this person. So I don't know how legitimate their information was. Um, yeah, I don't know how legitimate their information was because this person told me that the beings who came and got me were Pleiadians, that it wasn't an abduction, it was a healing, and that there was trauma, and that me and another one of my siblings went on the ship to have trauma healed and erased from us. I don't know. So that part, I don't know if I, it, although it seems like it could have been accurate information, a lot of other things that ended up happening and transpiring with that person mm, leads me to believe that, you know, anything that they told me, I will not take completely as um, truth. Now, we have time. Uh I have one other weird experience that I want to share with you. Do I do it now? Sure. Okay. So when I first moved to LA, I moved here in 2012. This must have been 2013-ish. Yeah, probably was around 2013. Let me grab my drink. I like to do these videos like really late at night. Um, I don't know why. I just like to do them late at night. I feel like the like darkness of the room looks good. <sighs> Sorry. That loud ass ASMR for you. Ah. LaCroix. So. Okay. So when I first moved to L.A., like I said, you know, there was a lot of black magic in my family. So I had always been afraid of things like that. Um, obviously, my whole family is very connected to energies and all that stuff and aliens, especially. Um, but my grandmother, she used to do black magic, basically curses, hexes on people. You know, she was gypsy. Her family was from the Czech Republic. They were gypsy. You know, there was magic being practiced. And my grandma got very, like, also linked up with, like I said, the Haitian voodoo people. And, you know, not saying there's anything, you know, wrong or scary about that. You know, everyone has their different um, perceptions of, you know, what they resonate with and the energies that they're connected to. Um, so she was very involved with that. And, you know, so there was always kind of that element in my house. And like I said, there was that, you know, jar of cow's blood in the closet, which kind of haunted my house for like 18 years and made it super fucking scary. Um, so I always had like kind of like, apprehension towards anything like that like when I was younger 
I wouldn't go in a crystal store. You know, where I grew up, you know, like I said, it was a very diverse area. So there was a lot of botanicas, which is like, you know, there was like a lot of Santeria and stuff. A lot of my friends' parents did Santeria. Uh, we were so ridiculous. We used to steal the money from the Santeria things because <laughs> and buy weed with it. So terrible. You know, like people put the offerings to like the creepy little dolls, the Santeria stuff, and like they put money in it. We used to steal the fucking money and buy weed with it. It was so bad. (laughs) Anyway. um, So, I mean, I was scared of it, but I guess I wasn't that scared of it. We weren't scared enough to smoke the weed from the freaking Santeria baby doll. LaCroix. (laughs) The worst ad ever. (laughs) So. Okay. So just saying that, I was like very like not into that stuff. Then you move to LA and everyone kind of does a little bit of magic here. You know, there's a lot of, especially now, it's like full blown everywhere. You know, now with social media and everything, everyone does like magic. Everyone does like rituals. Everyone does all this stuff. When I first moved to LA, I was like, wow, like this is like, you know, really big here. And I got more comfortable with it because I started to see kind of like different ways of it being done because the stuff that I saw was more, at least to me, scary. Um, And then as I came here, I became more comfortable with it because I saw things that were like not scary. So, you know, I started to dabble in some things like um, nothing crazy, you know, no cow's blood. I would never. I love cows so much. Um, They're my favorite animals. And so, you know, there was different things. And, you know, I would do stuff with like crystals and rituals and little things like that, like regular stuff, nothing crazy, intention setting, things like that. So, you know, I just kind of was doing some of that stuff. Um, But my intentions were not pure. My intentions were I wanted to have success. I wanted to get good jobs. I wanted to get money. I wanted to, you know, have, you know, recognition. Uh, So the things I was asking for were very self-serving as opposed to, you know, it's not like I was doing, uh, it's not like I was manifesting you know, world peace, you know, kind of the stuff that I more go towards now, obviously, because it's important to me is like, you know, the new earth, like, it doesn't really matter what happens in the end, we need to all make sure that we do the best thing to make this planet go to its next phase, because humanity needs to go to its its next phase. The universe needs to go to its next phase, all of it, consciousness needs to go to its next phase. So it's like, There's stuff a lot bigger than jobs and things like that, which, um, so around the time that I started doing that stuff, uh, I started having like stomach issues and things like that. And now that's, I'm a big believer in like, if you manifest for greedy reasons, you're fucking up your health. Um, like this is why like witches in like TV and stuff were always like, And like old fairy tales and stuff, they were like depicted as having like gray hair and like missing teeth and like, uh, you know, warts and things. And they were like, you know, gross looking. I'm not saying witches are, but they were depicted this way because people who do magic for the wrong reasons, they do things to hurt people or to curse people or for greed or only for self-serving reasons, sorry, there was something really weird outside my door. Um, And so when you do those things, you're giving up a part of your life force. You're exchanging. So you have two types of energy. You have your life force, which is not rechargeable. It's your life force. And then you have your rechargeable energy that comes from sleeping and 
drinking water and eating food and getting rest and taking vitamins and stuff like that. You know, you have your regular rechargeable day-to-day life energy and then you have like your true essence of your life force. Now, when you're dabbling in self-serving magic um, purely for self-serving gain with a benefit to no one else or, you know, things along those lines, you're giving a little bit of part of that actual essence of your life force away in exchange for that. I don't care. I'm sure there's many people who, you know, practice and might disagree. This is what I've seen. This is what I've seen since I was a child. And I've seen it in people all the time. And I can tell even a lot of people who use the secret, when they do the secret only for self-serving, selfish reasons, you start to see it. Their hair starts to get all coarse. They start aging. They start looking all fucked up. They start looking old. The teeth start getting messed up. All of those things that like go first that you can see hair, teeth, nails, skin. Those things are like easy to see depletion in. You know, we don't see what's happening inside the body. And I I noticed it, you know, I, I see a lot of people who like get really crazy into like, you know, the get rich manifestations and shit. And it's like, yeah. And then that's why they start getting all the fucking Botox and stuff and everything too, because they you know, look like shit, you know, because they're selling a part of their life force in exchange for material gain, for things that don't even matter, for things that like literally don't even matter. And so, you know, when I started to feel comfortable with like magic stuff and I started, you know, doing little small rituals, you know, things like little crystal grids and things like that, but only for like, you know, this is going to do really well. I'm going to get this type of job. Uh, I'm going to make this money, a lot of money. Um, And not saying you can't manifest money, but you don't do it in those ways. You do it in a way that like you can just live abundantly and free you know, where you and your family and others can be happy and you're happy in a place where you can help others and you can help the world and you could teach the world things, you know, there's differences, you know, you'd have to do it in a way that is giving to others, you know, uh, and so the reason I'm prefacing all this is because, I always felt very protected my whole life. You know, I lived in, you know, Jersey City was not safe. I lived in New York after that. And then I lived in LA. I've only lived in highly populated, super dense, dirty, dark cities. Um, And I've always felt protected. There could be crazy stuff going on in the street. I knew that it would never touch me. I knew that I was never going to be bothered by those things you know people worry about like someone breaking in and stuff I have no doubt in my mind that that will never happen to me like I just don't it's never crossed like not that it's never crossed my mind I just know that I'm protected and I've always known that I'm protected I feel protected now when I started doing this like little stupid self-serving magic bullshit that protection felt like it was gone like I literally felt like this weird fear of like Something bad could happen to me. I could be attacked. And things started happening. Like, I was walked in the street. I was always fine, untouched. No matter what was going on, it would happen around me. It was never me. It never happened anything dangerous to me in those ways. And when I was doing that stuff, not only did my health, I started having digestive issues. You know, I started, my skin was just looking kind of like, grayish and then this happened it took us a while to get here but I'm going to do it anyway so the reason I'm tagging this on to the alien story you'll find out why Um, so I'm waiting for the bus to go to work 
And this must have been, like I said, 2013 or so. And some guy is at the bus stop. So I'm standing at the bus stop. There's a guy who's from Boston who's telling me he just moved here. And, you know, he's hitting on me and stuff. And then there's these two ladies. Um, one is like an older Latino lady and one is an older Asian lady. And later I find out that neither of them really speak English in the story. Um so, you know, there's kind of like two grandmas and this man. So the guy's like talking to me and he's like, oh, you know, East Coast, do this, that. And like, so I'm looking this way. The bus is going to come down this way. So I'm looking down the street, like for when the bus is coming, the guy is facing me. And as he's talking, I notice something coming from down the block and it's like dark like physically dark like almost like a freaking shadow and I look and this thing is coming here and it's a guy and so he has like his hoodie is like this so it's like he's blocking and it was like super sunny like one of those like painfully sunny California days and it's not like those like nice ones with the palm trees it was like in Hollywood where there's like it's just hot concrete and it's hot bright white hot sun um like uncomfortable and so I just thought that maybe like I mean I don't know what I thought because I just saw this like dark being coming down the street so I was like what the fuck and then so it's like holding this like hoodie over itself so the hoodie is almost like a little covering so it's not letting the sun like touch itself and then uh it's like casting a shadow around it um you know I don't have anything here to do it with but you get it um so like I see this dark thing coming down the street and then like I look closer and it's like very questionable and I don't mean to you know I don't want to say this in a way that is sounding like insensitive to because it's not this was not something to do with like gender this was something weird so this person he's like walking like this but like his body is like like slithering like, and he's not wearing a shirt and it's just like ripped, like skinny ripped, like so, but the thing is, is that he's moving like very like, like a snake, like sexy, like Selma Hayek in From Dust Till Dawn when she's doing that like dance but like a very like ripped guy but very skinny like super ripped like crazy definition of like veins and muscles and everything and is like doing this slithering snake dance down the fucking street of Hollywood at like nine o'clock in the morning. So I'm like talking to this guy from Boston and I kind of just like see this like thing and I'm like, like literally like I get like locked on what I'm watching because I'm like, this person looks like a woman the way that it's like moving like super like a, succubus but then is like ripped crazy like a man and is like got this shadow around it like completely and I'm like what the fuck and this person is wearing dark black glasses and it's coming down the street and locks eyes well it has glasses on but then it looks at me and when we lock eyes I swear to God 
his shirt changed. He takes down the hoodie and then he's wearing like a wife beater or whatever, like a, a tank top and then has the hoodie on over it. And literally we lock, uh, lock looking at each other and he zooms into me. He did not step. He did not walk. Zoomed. Like literally shape-shifted outfits in front of my fucking eyes. Zooms into me like r- ridiculous. Like I'm seeing it in my head right now. This talk is fucking crazy. So he zooms in. When he zooms, I'm like up against the pole of the f- the bus stop so there's like the little sign for the bus stop and I was not I was near it I wasn't like leaning against it and zooms in and this person says to me can you see me and now we're face to face like right here and you know like I said I'm tall so I'm taller than this person um Now, it's interesting is we're talking about like this feminine masculine energy that was already like popping very quickly between because coming down the street was like this like super crazy, like ultra feminine sexual energy, like snake like. And then when the zoom happened into me, the energy was like masculine, like monster, like wants to like kick my ass like quick instantaneously like flipped when the clothes like when this like image shifted it went from like super feminine to super masculine like ultra charged and I was like and he's like can you see me so I just keep looking at him because I'm like I don't know. I just had the feeling like don't engage. And usually I would, you know, usually I react quickly, you know, especially back then when I hadn't done as much work on myself, I was ready to fight. You know, I could be pushed to fight even today after all the work I've done. I do. I mean, I go there sometimes. Uh, You know, I, I have like the ability to, have rage and even though it takes a lot but when that (laughs) fucking pops off it's there so he says it again he's like can you see me and like duh I can see him he's screaming in my fucking face so I don't say anything still and then he yells at me again and he's like can you fucking see me And then I'm like, yeah, I fucking see you. And then he goes, good. And then starts like sexually like snake rubbing himself all over his body in like the creepiest unhuman way. (laughs) And it's like, good. Because I'm the sexiest thing you've ever fucking seen. And then from behind, rips off his own sunglasses. One eye is a human eye. This eye is a yellow fucking snake eye. And then he goes, pulls it off. It's like, good, because I'm the sexiest thing you've ever fucking seen pulls it off and goes and spits this spit defies all laws of physics edge at the moment that he like when I see the snake eye I'm like (gasps) and I'm sure I jumped back from fear 
but I feel like I got thrown back and I hit my head. I get hit across the freaking pole and like hard. So then I'm like kind of like up against the pole and then the spit, he's like, and it literally comes and I'm like, (gasps) And it literally goes in my mouth, down my fucking throat. Down my throat. I will never forget the taste. I can never forget the taste. And then he's gone. So I look over to the stupid fucking Boston guy who was hitting on me like, And I look over to the two grandmas and I'm like, everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. Like this didn't like, hello. Like, so I actually get angry because like literally I just got attacked. So I said this person was homeless when I told people the story because it kind of like took like a while to process and I was like he was homeless and he had a snake eye but he wasn't really like homeless he was pretty clean you know and like his clothes were clean he wasn't homeless I think I just didn't know what to make of what happened and his behavior um but so I look at the ladies and I look at the guy the guy is like literally couldn't be like less bothered by the situation like you know by the way guys if you're gonna hit on a girl and then she gets like attacked like just fucking leave if you're not gonna like at least be like hey are you okay or whatever just just leave just like never hit on another girl again for the rest of your life but so then I look at the grandmas and they're both looking at me like and I'm like well could I have a fucking tissue Because, you know, they always got fucking tissues on them. Like, my grandma always had them up her sleeve. Like, come on. Give me some. I'd rather have your dirty fucking snot tissue than this fucking guy's spit down my throat and in my face. And I take off my glasses because everyone's kind of looking at me like. Silent. No one will ask if I'm okay. No one will ask like, whoa. No one will even be like whoa that was weird wow that guy was crazy no zero zero reaction from the three people like were these people even fucking real is how I felt like and I felt like literally the first thing that came into my mind after like the way that they were looking at me I was like did that shit like happen in this dimension like it's weird that that's the first thing I thought like was it in this dimension what the fuck was that what the hell just happened and I take off my glasses because I had sunglasses on and there was spit on the sunglasses so I know that it was physical in the 3d so then the bus gets there like just as I'm seeing the spit on my glasses and I get on the bus I'm shook up I still go to work because you know whatever type of fucking problems I got that I don't want to call out of work uh And just like was like the whole day at work, I was like, why did no one ask if I was okay? Why did no one acknowledge it? And I knew I moved from New York. You know, I I had lived in New York before I lived in L.A. And obviously before that, I was in Jersey. And, you know, when something happens in the street, other people either like jump in or say something or at least like afterwards are like, oh, man, fuck that guy. This was nothing like The ladies, after I, like, yelled at them to give me a tissue, one of them gave me a squirt of hand sanitizer. Which, what was I going to do with it? Drink it? But, you know. So, I'm at work and I'm like, yo, I might leave this fucking city. Like, this place is disgusting. This place is horrible. L.A. is the worst. I don't want to live here anymore. Like, this is how, I'm like, of course something like this could happen anywhere. But only in L.A. would someone look at you like you're the crazy one for being attacked. Fuck this place. Fuck these people. I'm leaving. Um, 
But I kept asking the question, why? Why were those people looking at me like that? Why did no one ask if I was okay? That's really weird. Like, I don't understand that reaction. And so the next day I'm at the bus stop again because, you know, I guess it's hard to, you know, stop me from working. Um, and I get on the bus. It's the same bus driver. And he goes, hey, are you okay? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, someone told me that some guy attacked you yesterday. If I was there, I would have messed him up. So my initial reaction was reactionary and kind of nasty and was like, oh, wow, like that's great that someone would gossip to you about what happened to me, but then wouldn't even be able to ask me whether I was okay themselves. Okay, all right. And then I went and sat down and was like, wow, this place really is a piece of shit because, (laughs) yeah, people really will just like, not only not ask if you're okay, but then gossip about it. But after I thought about it some more and I learned more, you know, at the time I didn't know about, you know, I I had heard about that the world is a matrix and that it was possible that we were in a simulation and, you know, but I hadn't really like looked into it yet. And then when I did start looking into it, like I kept thinking about that day and kept thinking like, why did those people act like they didn't see it? But then obviously they did see it if they told someone. So then I was wondering, like, did the matrix, like, correct itself? Because I kept asking, why did no one ask if I was okay? And then literally someone who wasn't even there, who I never spoke to before, asked if I was okay. So... This was one of the other things I asked about in hypnosis. I wanted to know what really happened. Was that guy a reptilian? Like, what was that? Because, I mean, that eye, that snake eye, and at the time I didn't really know about reptilians. And, but that eye was like, I mean, it's scary as hell. So the answer that I got under hypnosis was that Yes, it was a reptilian, um, that it was not really like anything targeted towards me, that basically my energy pissed him off, that he was just walking down the street, he was just, you know, doing his, I don't know, reptilian shit, uh, blocking himself from the hot ass sun, and when he saw me staring at him, my energy pissed him off and he just didn't like me. And that he did that to scare me simply because he was reacting to me that he was like, you know, on his grumpy way and then saw me looking at him. And that's why he did that. And Huh. Yeah. Pretty interesting. So, you know, that's why I'm including that as an alien experience because it's kind of along those lines, but yeah. Well, guys, again, thanks for watching. Um, stay tuned. I will be doing an alien series on my TikTok. I'm going to finish the Mandela effect series first Um, However, I do want to warn you guys, you know, with the Alien series, I'm going to be referencing a lot of different sources. Some will be channeled. Some will be, you know, people who've had experiences. And a lot of them will also be people who have allegedly worked for the Secret Space Program and have worked for the government in those programs that are dealing with aliens. And that's like a very, apparently, I didn't realize until I posted something about it, that it's like a very, like, crazy topic for people and I just want to let you know like I'm not saying any of the people I'm getting information from or that I'm sourcing of information are perfect I'm not even saying Dolores Cannon is perfect like it's not about 
you know, I'm even looking at the book like Behold the Pale Horse by William Cooper. William Cooper was far from perfect, you know, but that doesn't mean that these people don't have some interesting or legitimate info to provide. So, you know, take the whole cancel culture stuff to whatever side of TikTok, you know, that happens on because, yeah. I'm just blocking people who are doing the identity politics shit. Um, anyway, those are my alien stories. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate you being here. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>